Hi everyone and welcome to Brian's Horror Corner. And welcome to this movie review video as part of my February Horror Series, which is taking a look at the entire Scream franchise. Including the newest Scream movie um, that's still at theaters, Scream 2022 or Scream 5, if you will. Um, and that's the one I'll be reviewing today. So yeah, let's just go ahead and get into it. Obviously, I don't have a I don't have a box cover, or a case or anything for it because it's still at the theater and it hasn't been uh, released on DVD yet. Um, also, I want to make the caveat that two things I'm going to try, like I'm going to try even harder not to have any spoilers in this video. I do with all of these reviews, but particularly this movie because it's still at the theater. And also for the sake of the, for the, sake of uh, this video, I'm going to refer to this movie as Scream 5, even though that's not really the title of the movie. It is the fifth the fifth Scream movie in the franchise. So, um, But to avoid confusion talking about the original Scream in this one, I'm going to refer to this as Scream 5. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to make this review too long either. Um, I had a lot to say about this movie, so let's just go ahead and get into it. So Scream 2022, also known as Scream 5, is an American slasher film directed by Radio Silence and written by James Vanderbilt and Guy Busick. It is the fifth installment of the Scream film series. Though billed as a relaunch of the film series, the film is a direct sequel to Scream 4 from 2011. And it is the first film in the series not to be directed by Wes Craven, who passed away sadly in 2015. Rest in peace, Wes Craven. Um, the film takes place 25 years after the original Woodsboro murders, when yet another ghost face appears and begins targeting a group of teenagers who are each somehow linked to the original killings. Similar to the previous entry, Scream combines the violence of the slasher genre with elements of black comedy and whodunit mystery to satirize the trend of reboots and legacy sequels. The film also provides commentary on fandom culture and the divide between elevated horror and classic slasher films. So basically the film opens 25 years after Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker's killing spree in Woodsboro. A high school student named Tara Carpenter is home alone when she is attacked by Ghostface and left hospitalized. In Modesto, Tara's estranged older sister, Sam Carpenter, is informed about the attack by Wes Hicks, one of Tara's friends. Sam returns to Woodsboro with her boyfriend, Richie, to visit Tara at the hospital, where Sam is reunited with Tara's friend group. That night, Liv's, Liv's ex-boyfriend, Vince Schneider, who is Stu Mocker's nephew, is killed by Ghostface outside of a bar. At the hospital, Sam is attacked by Ghostface and, tell, and tells Tara that she has been dealing with hallucinations of Billy Loomis, who Sam learned as a teenager was her biological father. Sam's true par patronage, parentage, resulted in their parents' separation and is why Sam became estranged from Tara. Sa Tara, Sam, and Richie visit Dewey Riley, who is divorced from Gail Weathers. They ask for his help in stopping the killer, and he contacts Gail and Sidney Prescott, warning them about the return of Ghostface. So that's basically the setup and the, the opening, um, the setup, the premise and the opening of the movie. Um, Cast-wise, we have Melissa Barrera, uh, Barrera as Sam Carpenter, Mason Gooding as Chad Meeks Martin, Mickey Madison as Amber Freeman, Dylan Minnette as Wes Hicks, Jenna Ortega as Tara Carpenter, Jack, Jack Quaid, or Quad Quaid as as Richie Kirsch, Marley Shelton returning from part four as Sheriff Judy Hicks, Jasmine Save Savio Brown as Mindy Meeks Martin, Sonia Amar as Liv McKenzie, Courtney Cox as Gail Weathers, David Arquette as Dewey Riley, and Nev Campbell as Sidney Prescott. So yeah, it's a pretty big cast and uh I basically wanted to list everybody there in case, uh, as I'm trying to make my points here and talking about characters and things that I don't forget the names of anybody or the actor or actress's name either. So, so yeah, Scream 5 I saw in the theater a few days ago. Um, I went to an afternoon matinee, and um, I got to say, for the most part, I enjoyed it. Um, again, just like Part 4, it's, I've only seen it once, obviously. Um, so those two films, I'm 
you know, are going to be more off my gut from a one-time watch as opposed to the first three films, which obviously I own and have seen multiple times. But let's just go ahead and get into it, starting with the pros. Um, I like the opening sequence of the film. I thought it was kind of a return to form um, from some of the more recent sequels where I don't think the opening was quite as good. Um, the opening, a lot like the first movie, the original Scream, is suspenseful with some new updated clever twists and turns and dialogue. Um, it was sort of, a, it's an enjoyable way to get into the movie, much like the first couple of movies in the franchise were. So yeah, props to the original or to the opening sequence of this movie. Um, as far as characters go, there's a few of them that stood out to me that I want to mention. Um, as far as our legacy characters go, um, David Arquette gets to nod in this movie as far as the... Um, as the, the character of Dewey. I thought he did a really good job in this movie. Um, he wasn't always the best character in the previous four films, but in this movie, he's he's really all in, it seems like. David Arquette has this character. He really gives it his all, and I think gives a really good performance. And the character itself is... It's got a pretty nice character arc um, in this particular story. Also, for some of the new characters... Uh, I think the two leads, the new leads, Jenna Ortega as Tara and Melissa Barrera as Sam, they do a they do a pretty good job portraying the, these uh, lead characters, um, and that they do a good job leading the way for the most part. I feel like in this movie, um, I thought their acting was was good, especially Jenna Ortega. She really she really stood out to me. Melissa. Uh, Barrera is a little bit more uneven, I thought, but she's also caring quite a bit in this movie. So for the most part, I thought they were both really good, though. Um, Got to talk about the violence in this movie. Of all the screen movies, I think this one, I think Ghostface is definitely the most violent in this movie. Um, it's not necessarily the goriest movie. I know some people say that it is, and I, I would say that it's up there on par with a couple of the other Scream movies. But from a violence standpoint, as far as the the uh, the stabbing and the, just the overall violence of, of Ghostface, this movie definitely um, ratchets it up uh, most of any of the movies, I think, so far. Um, there, it's, it is a very bloody and gory movie. I mean, the kills themselves are very bloody and gory. I think they're probably on par with part four in the original for me. Um, but I don't know that it's the goriest of the series. Again, some of this might change over time as I watch uh, the last couple movies more. Um, I have to give them credit. There's actually some fairly suspenseful scenes within the movie. I think they do a pretty good job of playing with the audience's expectations in terms of what they expect to have happen um, and kind of turn that on its head a little bit. There are certain scenes, a couple scenes in the basement having to do with the refrigerator. Um, there's a scene in a house earlier on in the movie. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, they, they do a pretty decent job with suspense and also that opening, the opening sequence, of course, as well. Um, they do pay a lot of homage to the original Scream movie uh, through the story of this one, as well as the, the sort of having the modern and clever sort of self-awareness that they use in this movie. So you can tell the directors of this movie really tried to pay homage and give all the respect and credit to Wes Craven with what he created and specifically the 1996 screen movie. Um, they even repeat some certain, um, certain scenes or certain, um, certain ideas with a new modern twist on it. So for that, for, I thought they did a pretty good job in that, in that, in that regard, in terms of paying homage. Um, I especially like the self-aware, the new self-aware, um, aspects that are used, especially as it relates to the, uh, to the name Requel, and if you if you've seen the movie, you know what that's uh, what that's referring to. I don't want to get too into it, but my understanding is a requel is basically a cross between a sequel and a reboot. Thus, the title, thus the name Requel, which is kind of what this movie is. It's definitely a sequel to the other. It falls in line with the other four movies before this as a fifth sequel, but it's also a reimagining, reboot in a sense um, from those other four movies. Um, I think the filmmakers overall did a good job of maintaining the level of consistency that the audience has come to expect in these Scream movies. Um, in terms of the quality and the overall tone of the pre of the other previous movies that were obviously Wes Craven directed Scream movies. 
And my final positive or pro, I have to say, is the movie looks really good. It's really well shot. The cinematography is really good in this movie. Definitely a step up from part four, which I had some issues with the cinematography and the colors and, and things of how they shot it in that movie. But it's definitely on par, on point in this movie. So, so yeah, those are my pros with the, with the new Scream 5 movie. Um, Got to get into some cons as well. Just like the third movie, although not quite as bad. The writing, not having Kevin Williamson as the writer in this movie, um, it is noticeable again. Like I said, not as much as it was in the third movie, but um, it really misses Kevin Williamson, especially in terms of the quick-witted and clever writing, both in terms of the story, but more importantly, I would say in terms of the characters in this movie. That's really where it's lacking. Um, there are a lot of new characters here in this movie, and unfortunately, quite a few of them are pretty forgettable. Like I said earlier, that's why I had to, that's why I had such a big cast role here that I named off because I wanted to, um, I just couldn't remember them off the top of my head other than, other than Sam and Tara. And of course, our, our legacy characters, the rest of them, I was really drawing a blank on off the top of my head. So yeah, that's, that's where the writing kind of comes back to bite them in the butt a little bit. The characters just aren't that memorable. Um, we're introduced to so many as well, but we're just not given anything with them to end up really caring about them, especially in terms of what happens to them throughout this movie. Um, just very vanilla, I felt like the characters. Um, another problem I have is the reveal of the killer in this movie is probably the most anticlimactic and underwhelming of the entire franchise, in my opinion. Um, they did the whole, we'll try will try to be overly obvious to set it up so that the audience can't think that it's this person when really not being fooled. At least I wasn't in the least. Um, just poor setup. This is the only screen movie that I was actually able to figure out who the killer was, at least partially, um, or as early as I did compared to any of the other screen movies. And like I said, they try to throw you off by making it too obvious, but it just doesn't work. At least it didn't for me. I'm only speaking for me, but um, I just wasn't fooled by it. I just thought the setup was really poor. And obviously that's disappointing in a screen movie because it's all about who done it and the reveal of the killer. On to that point, I thought the, the whole third act of the movie was kind of disappointing to me, a little bit underwhelming. There were no real stakes. And we kind of got the lamest, ki the lamest killer motivations in the entire franchise, in my opinion. Um, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want to give spoilers again. Um, but it's just the motivations just didn't work for me um, at all in this movie. Very cheap and lazy, I thought. And again, that goes back to the writing. Um, the characters of Gail and Sydney, as much as I love them as, as legacy characters in this franchise, they really... They really feel for they really feel shoehorned into this movie and are really only in the third act of this movie to begin with. Gail, I thought, was kind of shoehorned into the fourth movie a little bit too, but this is the first movie that I didn't feel like Sydney needed to be there at all, quite frankly, other than the fact that it's a screen movie and oh, we we got to put the butts in the seat, so Sydney's got to be in this movie, but. When I watched the movie, I was like, she really didn't need to be here. Like in all the other four movies, you could find some connection, some reason for her needing to be there. Now, something does happen in this movie that does bring her back into the movie. But as far as the as far as the killer of this movie goes, there's really no connection specifically. I'll just leave it at that. Um, just doesn't feel natural like it did in the other movies. Like I said, it just felt like we got to have these legacy characters in this movie just to have them in there. Um, the comedy doesn't land quite as well for me. There's a few parts that I laugh with some of the some of the meta ness and some of the, the the tropes that they use in more modern the more modern ideas, especially as it relates to elevated horror. I got kind of a kick out of that and some of the the newer movies that they talk about or, or poke fun at in this movie, but I didn't think the comedy lands quite as well, um, and part of that's because, okay, this movie as good as it is, I think, and it is an enjoyable screen movie, it's not as it doesn't seem to be as fun or as entertaining as the Wes Craven ones were they seem to be a little bit more careful in this movie, I feel like, than Wes Craven ever worried about being and, and therefore it's just not, it's not as fun now it is darker 
I would argue that it's, it's as suspenseful as the first movie, since the first movie, but it doesn't have that fun sort of screen quality that you kind of look for when you watch these films, at least not to me. Um, and then, yeah, getting on to my final sort of con or thing I didn't really care for, it's, you got to talk about the plot. The plot holes are the moments that, where you really have to suspend disbelief. It starts with a pretty obvious, obvious one, which is Sam's age. And being the daughter of Billy Loomis, it doesn't quite jive if you think about it because Sam, we know she's 23 in this movie because she talked about five years um, when she was 18 being away, basically, and, um, you know, getting away from everything. So we know she's 23. Well, the problem with that is Billy Loomis died 25 years ago during the Woodsboro mur murders, which are mentioned here. So... There's a two-year gap there that just doesn't quite fit. Um, the fight at the hospital with Dewey, once you realize who the killers are, the killer is, I should say, it doesn't really jive. You really have to suspend disbelief that this killer could basically kick Dewey's ass and throw him around a little bit. Um, and then the ghost face killing a character outside your own house in broad daylight as well. We've never seen that in a Scream movie. Again, I know you've always had to suspend disbelief in Scream movies. That's part of what makes them fun. They're not exactly, um, you know, they're not exactly plot driven where everything makes sense. and It's totally realistic. But I don't know. I felt of all the movies, this one, I really had to suspend disbelief. And like I said, there's just some plot holes that don't work there. Um Empty hospital hallways. I don't know about you. I've been to a few hospitals at night even. And I've never seen a complete ward or wing of a hospital be completely empty minus one security guard who was killed. So that doesn't quite jive for me either. Um, I thought they forced a, a, a little too much of the finger pointing as well in this movie, especially between friends. No, you could be the killer. You could be the killer. It just kind of got old towards the end. Um, it kind of reminded me of another recent movie that came out, Evil Dies Tonight. Um, if you've seen that movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. It just it just felt a little too forced, a little just not natural. And um, I don't know. I know what they were trying to do, but it felt a little bit forced. But, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. I know I ended up having more cons than pros. So you're probably going to think, well, you hated this movie. I really didn't, and I think I'm going to actually like it more upon rewatch. There's, It definitely did feel like a screen movie for the most part. Um, I thought they did a good job, minus Wes Craven not being involved for obvious reasons. Kevin Williamson not writing it. I know he was still involved, which helped. He was an executive producer, I believe, of the movie. But overall, I still had a good time with it. It was still Scream. Um, they still... They still had all the meta-ness and the, the self-awareness um, ratcheted up to a modern version that I thought worked for the most part. And like I said, I, th I enjoyed the two lead characters, and I enjoy enjoyed Dewey's character in this movie. And you always, as much as I like seeing Sidney and Gail, it just felt like they were pigeonholed in a little bit more in this movie. I already know they green-lighted a Scream 6, so I guess the only thing I would say is I kind of hope that don't bring don't feel the need to bring Sydney and Gail back because I'm assuming they're gonna they're gonna have the the two leads again the sisters but unless there's really a strong reason to bring them back don't just bring them back to because it's a screen movie and we got to have Sydney in it um because Sydney's I mean I just kind of feel like she's moved on now she's she's in her upper 40s she's married she's got kids and unless she's directly tied to anything to do with the movie I just I don't think you should bring her back. I think you should really detach and move on here if you're going to continue making these. But that's just those are just my thoughts about this movie. Guys, overall, I enjoyed it. And I'm going to give this movie a 7.5 out of 10. Um, I thought it was a solid screen movie, for especially being a fifth entry, especially not having Wes Craven involved, and especially not having Ke Kevin Williamson writing. Like I mentioned, there's a few things that I didn't like about it, but I could still watch this movie. It's enjoyable. So 7.5 out of 10 for me. If you've seen the movie, go ahead and comment down below if you have any questions about it, what your thoughts are about it, without giving any scenes or spoilers away. Please like this video and hit the little notification bell below so you don't miss my last video in this series, which is ranking all these screen movies in the franchise. And please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my great horror content coming up over the next three or four months that I already have planned. So thank you for watching this very long video. Um, 
Scream 5's at theaters. Go check it out if you guys haven't yet. Or Scream 2022. I call it Scream 5. But thank you for watching this video. Stay scared. Bye.